This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 33 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, everyone. I hope this finds you well. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm in Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, when I say beautiful upstate New York, it is no exaggeration. It has been an absolutely gorgeous week here on the homestead, and we have gotten a lot of stuff accomplished. And so I am excited to share that with you. So without further ado, let's jump right into this week's homestead happenings. Now, I say we got a lot of stuff accomplished on the homestead this week, and we certainly did, but we did start the week out taking a day off. Uh, we spent the day on Monday, Memorial Day. Uh, we usually take a drive up to my grandparents' grave, and usually we go with my aunt and uncle, but this year, due to the whole COVID thing, uh, my my wife and I and our son uh, went by ourselves, and it's just an absolutely beautiful drive as we go, and usually what we do is we go up the uh, eastern side of Lake Champlain, and then we bring the ferry across Lake Champlain, and we come back down on the western side. And this year, we actually did a little bit of a different uh, jog. We came down through uh, Lake George, so we actually came down the uh, western side of Lake George, and it's just an absolutely beautiful drive, and it's always a, a great time to go up there. Um, you know, it, it takes us a couple hours to get up there and usually we spend maybe 20 minutes or half an hour actually at my grand grandparents' grave. But you guys know, I've shared with you and I close out every show quoting my grandfather, you know the impact that he had uh, on me and, and my homesteading journey. And so every year as we're there at his graveside, I always reflect on some of the lessons that I learned for him, from him. And I remember in his later years when he was living up at my aunt's house, he was no longer able to live on his home, but he would visit here at our our homestead and he would take a look around and then he would say to me, Brian, just keep up the good work. And I hope that we're doing him proud. I'd like to think that we are. And so it was just a, a very special time as it is every year uh, for me to sit there um, and reminisce uh, of some of the memories that we had together. Um, and I'm so glad that my son was able to spend some time and really got to know his great grandfather well. And so it was just a really great time, even though we took some time away from the homestead, there still was that homestead connection because there will always be a homestead connection with my grandfather. And I'm so thankful that, uh, I, I had those years where I could learn from him, and I had the opportunity to uh, to spend time with him, and I have things here on my homestead. Some people may think it's cheesy, but the fact that the door to my chicken coop, the door to my mobile chicken coop came out of my grandfather's coop means a whole heck of a lot to me. The feeders, many of the feeders that we use were feeders that my grandfather had, and I think there's just something to be said about those heritage connections, those heirloom connections that I have. Um, and it, it's something that I hope to be able to pass on, whether or not it's to my son or to my to my grandkids, who, who knows. But I do hope that I'm able to pass on a legacy like my grandfather passed on to me. And as I use the feeders and the cast iron frying pans, and I go in and out of the coops using the doors that he used for decades. It brings a smile to my face. And I'm just very, very thankful and blessed to have called Malcolm Wells my grandfather, my papa. This week, we also uh, did a lot of things around the homestead. And really, our focus this week was twofold. Number one was getting the garden in. And number two was prepping for meat bird processing, which we did yesterday and today. 
So before we get to the meat, Bert, uh, we did spend a lot of time in the garden this week and really spending time in the roost out beds, getting um, transplants put in there, getting melons and peppers and tomatoes and broccoli all planted in the roost out bed. My potatoes are starting to pop up in the roost out bed. That's very, very exciting. Starting to see some of the asparagus pop through that I planted a couple of weeks ago. So that's very exciting. Overall, the gardens are looking great. I did spend some time yesterday up at the square foot gardens doing some weeding. And uh, things up there are just really starting to pop. And I really need to get some updated pictures up on our Instagram and Facebook account so you can kind of see what we've been up to uh, in the garden and you can see how things are progressing. I did uh, post a picture this week of the first potato that popped through. I was so excited about that. That was in the Ruth Stout bed. If you haven't already, I would suggest that you check us out on Instagram and on Facebook. I'm also on Reddit now. Uh, so if you look for the Homestead Journey podcast in any of those locations, um, you'll be able to keep up to date with what we've got going on here on the Homestead and also on our website, thehomesteadjourney.net. All of those updates uh, are available there as well. But really the biggest news this week was it was meat bird processing weekend. And so my preparations really started on Memorial Day because I stopped by Harbor Freight and picked up a new motor for my chicken plucker. Now I have a whiz bang chicken plucker that I built five or six years ago. And I started out using a pool pump motor that someone had given to me and one of the mounting brackets was broken. It actually was like a 3700 RPM motor instead of the recommended 1800 RPM motor. So I was using a series of pulleys to kind of step things up and step things down because you're trying to get your RPMs on your plucker to between 270 and 300 RPMs. Well, because of all of that cobbing, <laughs> or the homestead hack jobs, as my son would call them, um, it just never really worked as well as I would hope the belt would slip. Uh, it just never really seemed to have enough torque. And so this year I was determined it was time to upgrade that. And so I did swing into Harbor Freight. I bought a motor with good mounts. <laughs> and uh, I got all of that put together uh, for yesterday, yesterday being Saturday. And so we went ahead and processed uh, 24 birds or 25 birds yesterday. Things by and large went well. The upgrade to the plucker worked well. One of the things though, as the day went on, it seemed like as moisture got down into the belts, we started getting a little bit more slippage. And so it wasn't plucking quite as well at the end of the day as it was at the beginning of the day. But we had the opportunity today to process my dad's meat birds. And so what we did is we used less water in the plucker and that really seemed to help. Um, the belts weren't slipping as much. And so at the end of the day, things, the plucker was working better. Now we had a little bit of an issue where unfortunately the temp in our scalder dropped a little bit. And so we weren't getting quite as good of a scald as we had hoped. And so that affected the plucking a little bit towards the end of the day, but just something to file away for the next time that we do this. And that's something that I try to do every time we process meat birds. I try to think about how can we do this better? Is there something additional that I can buy or is there something additional I can build? Or is there a change that we can make to the process that will make things more efficient, that will help us to process um, birds better and to have at the end of the day, a, a better overall finished product. One of the things that I built a couple of years ago is a simple structure made out of PVC and I posted pictures to it of it to our Instagram and Facebook uh, account so you can look at it there. But it's just a simple structure made out of PVC that has four arms that stick up. And then what you do is you put the chickens on those arms and it allows the birds to drain, but it also makes it easier for the uh, for us to put the shrink bags over those chickens. Now, what I wanted to do with that is I wanted to build it so that it was collapsible. And 
so when I put it all together, I didn't glue the PVC elbows together. I again, I wanted for it to be able to come apart. But what I've had problems with is when I get the chickens on that upright arm, sometimes what would happen is the weight of the chicken would cause it to shift one way or the other. And so I had a similar problem yesterday. And so what I did today, again, trying to learn from my mistakes, or I wouldn't even call it a mistake, we're just trying to improve upon the design, is I used some screws and uh, kind of screwed through the connector into the pipe and then marked it with a number so that I could take the screws out, disassemble it, and then the next time when I put it back together, the holes should match up and I'll be able to get everything to lock in place very, very nicely. The last thing that we added to the whole setup this year is I went out and I bought a large cooler, a Coleman 120 quart cooler so that we could put the meat birds on ice and let them rest for about 24 hours before we put them into the freezer. Now in the past what I've done is I had a whole bunch of different size coolers. You know, they were Omaha steak coolers. They were small coolers that we had for going camping, just a hodgepodge of coolers. But sometimes it was just really a pain to be able to fit everything into all of these small coolers. So I bit the bullet. We, we bought a large cooler, 120 quart cooler, and it held all of the meat birds very, very nicely. And then once we allowed them, them, them to chill overnight, I put them into the freezer uh, today and so very excited about the fact that we now have 25 meat birds in our freezer ready to go. And we learned some lessons and we're continuing to improve on our processing. So again, it was a great, great weekend. The, the last thing I wanted to share with you with regards to this is this is the first time that my son, Brian Jr., has actively taken part in the processing of the chickens. I have never forced him to be involved in it. And quite frankly, I doubt he will ever be involved with processing the standard breed chickens. He takes care of them. He loves them. And I'm just not going to force him to take part in, in processing them, even though we process them every year as we cycle out our flock. But he offered to uh, take part in uh, this weekend's uh, activities. And I tell you what, he was such a huge help. The first part of yesterday on Saturday morning, my dad and I got started about eight o'clock and, and my son didn't come out. So I think probably about, about nine o'clock. And when my son got involved and he was getting the chickens, he was bringing them, putting the kill cones. I was doing the kill. My son was not interested in doing that. Um, but then my son was scalding and plucking and it allowed my dad to focus on eviscerating. It really sped things up. And I was just so thankful for that. And it was something that it was just a pleasure to be a part of that with my son. And uh, as my dad and I uh, work together, it's always so much fun. I just love working with my dad so much. So blessed to be able to do this with him. And it was just an absolute joy for the three of us to make memories together. One funny story, and then we will move on to uh, this week's charting the course. But uh, we were putting the birds into the kill cones, and then what I would do is I would reach up and kind of pull the head down, steady it, and then do the deed. And there was one bird that I pulled its head down, and it like uh, it was like a geyser. It was like Old Faithful went off, and this squirt of manure popped up in the air. And the next thing I knew, I had chicken crap in my hair, on my face, on my shirt, I got pooped on. And it was not gray poop on. It was nasty. But we laughed and laughed and laughed. I have never, ever, ever had that happen. But when I pulled that chicken's head down to do the deed, it said, I'm going to show you. I'm going to get some revenge. And it was like this geyser just shot out of its rear end and it was all over me. Kind of nasty, kind of funny, but you know what? Chalk it up and put it in the memory bank. We made memories together and uh, we had as much fun as you can have when processing chickens.
All right, enough of that, folks. Let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. On this week's Charting the Course, I want to share with you a conversation that I had this week with a potential customer of ours. I had someone reach out to me who was interested in potentially buying a pig and maybe some meat birds from us, and they wanted to understand what we fed our animals and what our approach was from a philosophical perspective to farming. And I was so happy to have someone ask me these questions. And in part, it's because I think it's important for people to think about where their food comes from and how their food is raised and how their food is treated. And I think that's one of the great things about dealing with a small producer, uh, someone who is maybe a farmstead or, or a small homesteader like we are, or maybe even a, a local farmer who is doing things on a larger scale, but still isn't part of that giant, huge commercial agricultural food supply. Because you can talk to the farmer, you can understand how the animals are treated, you can come see the animals, you can understand uh, how the animals are fed, how they're cared for, and you can understand whether or not the philosophical approach of that farmer matches with your worldview. I think it's great. I think it's absolutely awesome. And so I was able to share with her this week our approach to farming, our approach to raising and growing food. But not only was I glad that she asked that question because she was considering it, but it was also good for me to think through this again. For me to stop and to pause and to think, okay, why do we do the things that we do? Why do we feed the feed that we feed? Why do we have this approach? And has anything changed whereby maybe we need to chart a little bit of a different course? And so as I got done with the long-winded response that I'm about to share with you, I did say to her, thank you so much for asking these questions. This is going to make a great podcast episode. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit about what we do here on our farm and why we do what we do. So again, initially her question was, what do you feed your animals? And to that I replied, I feed a locally milled conventional feed to both the meat birds and the pigs. And then I shared with her the local feed mill that I use for our feed. To that she replied with some additional questions. She said, we got non-GMO from the feed mill that we were using two years ago, I think, for our meat birds. Not sure they had it last year. She said, any particular reason you feed what you do? Philosophically, I understand the local. She said, we never raised a pig, but I know some mutual friends of ours used to get Hannaford produce that they would feed. She said, not trying to be a pain, but wanting to understand more about your farming methods and reasons if we get more food from you. And so this is how I replied to her. I am glad to answer questions. This is something I have wrestled with and put much thought into. I've got no blog post or podcast on this topic yet, but here is my approach to farming and why I use the local conventional feed. My philosophy is based in pragmatism. I try to do the best I can with what I've got. I try to use as organic of an approach as I can with both how I raise my animals as well as how I raise my vegetables. For example, I don't use conventional fertilizers on my garden or pesticides, or herbicides. But if I had an infestation of something that I wasn't able to handle with natural methods, and it was a matter of using a conventional product or losing the crop, I would use the conventional product. With our animals, I use the least amount of antibiotics and medicines as possible. However, because I have had a confirmed case of tetanus on my farm, I will vaccinate against it and when I castrate my males, I will give them a shot of penicillin. It is also required that any pigs older than four months that we show at the Washington County Fair have a rabies shot, so any that fit that bill would have had that shot. I also have dewormed sparingly with safeguard. 
I don't go overboard with any of those treatments, but I will do what I think is in the best interest of the health of my animals. I have seen some people who are so committed to their organic and natural approaches that they have allowed entire herds and flocks to die because they refuse to use antibiotics or conventional treatments. I cannot in good conscience do that. And so that brings us to the feed. My preference would be to use a locally sourced organic non-GMO feed if it made economic sense. However, the only place that I know of that has locally sourced organic non-GMO feed uh, is almost three times as much. It costs almost three times as much for the feed. And for me, that is a non-starter. I don't see people willing to pay $6 plus a dozen for eggs or double or triple what I charge for pork or chicken. There's another feed mill that's a little farther away that carries a non-GMO feed. But as far as I know, they don't claim that it is organic nor local. And if it is not local, I do not trust it. And it isn't that I don't trust that feed mill. It is that I do not trust the organic slash non-GMO food supply in general. Depending on the grain used in the feed, 70% of what is considered quote-unquote organic and quote-unquote non-GMO is imported from places like India, China, Russia, and Turkey. And I'll actually link to some articles talking about that in the show notes if you want to read further about that. Assuming for a moment that they are actually using organic techniques, and I cannot bring myself to even believe that, the pollution levels of places like that would really offset any benefits organic farming, in my opinion. And I'll link to another article that talks specifically about organic ginger that comes from China and how the water that is used to wash that actually contaminates it so badly that it no longer should be considered organic. All right, back to my response. Um, but beyond that, there are too many documented examples of conventional grade that went on the boat that miraculously became organic slash non-GMO when it came off the boat. And I'll link to some articles talking about that. So all of that to say that I have zero confidence that even if I were to pay the premium for an organic slash non-GMO feed from anyone that does not grow it themselves, that I'm actually getting what I pay for. So that brings us to the local feed mill that I use. Unfortunately, he no longer offers non-GMO feed. I'm not sure that he ever claimed that what he sold was organic, but I know in conversations with him that he opted to stop doing the non-GMO because he wasn't finding a consistent market for it. If he carried it, grew all of the grain that went into it, and I know he does buy in some of the grain that goes into his feed, and it were economically viable, I would purchase it from him. But since he doesn't, I can only buy conventional from him. Besides the concerns that people have regarding chemicals and GMOs in the food supply, another driving factor behind organic farming methods is environmental impact. People believe that organic methods are better for the environment. Now, in small-scale farming, I would argue that perhaps that is true. But in the larger scale farming that is needed to grow grain for animal feed, I don't believe that holds true. In fact, there are some who argue that reduced yields per acre of organic slash non-GMO crops is actually harder on the environment. And when you add in the carbon used to transport the grain from halfway around the world, I'm not convinced that that approach to organic slash non-GMO grains or even food is environmentally responsible. After reading the book, The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully, I have started questioning whether or not organic slash non-GMO feed actually is better for you or for your animals. And I'll put a link to Amazon. I, I'm not an affiliate yet. I should get become an affiliate. But I'll at least put a, a link to that book in case you want to check it out in the show notes. Um, but anyhow, back to this. Um, so after having read that book, I'm not, I'm not convinced that organic slash non-GMO feed is actually better for you or for your animals. I'm not saying that it is. I'm not saying that it isn't. I simply don't know. And then I went on to say this. I had considered trying to source more of my feed from a place such as Hannaford's, our local supermarket. But up to this point, for convenience reasons and logistical reasons, I have opted not to. 
uh, a local cheese maker has offered me some of their way. And again, for convenience and logistical reasons, I have opted not to go that route. I do feed some spent grain that I get from a local brewery when I can get it. It makes up about 20% of their feed. And I also will feed them any pumpkins and apples and such that I can gather in the fall. Also, my mom and dad's church has a food pantry, and so they will give me any bread that they have left over. But lately, because of the whole COVID thing, uh, that's been in short supply. So to sum it all up, I have landed on feeding a conventional feed from a local mill because I would rather buy local and know what I am getting, even if it isn't my ideal. Heck, having my pigs in paddocks isn't my ideal either. I'd much rather raise them on grassy pasture. I wish I had more grass in which to raise my meat birds. At the end of the day, I try to do the best I can with what I have. I know it's not everyone's ideal, and I understand why people might disagree with me, but I still think at the end of the day, the food we raise is much better than what I could get at the grocery store. And then I summed it up by saying this. Hopefully that answers your questions. If you have any further questions or need further clarification, let me know. And these are simply my opinions based on what I currently know, which is ever evolving. Now, folks, I don't share this with you because I'm trying to tell you that I think I'm right and that everybody else is wrong. The reason that I share this with you is because I think sometimes people allow the great to get in the way of the good. I think there's a lot of pressure sometimes for people, and especially people who are new to homesteading, to live up to a certain ideal, to a certain criteria. And that if you dare to homestead differently than homestead influencer X, or you don't buy your seeds from a particular place, or you don't buy a particular brand of feed, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> but the fact is, folks, not everyone can raise vegetables like Elliot Coleman. Not everyone can raise animals like Joel Salatin. And that's okay. I think we need to do the best we can with what we've got. And the fact that maybe we can't live up to even what is our own ideal. As I shared with you, I wish I had more pasture. I wish I had lush grass to put my pigs on and to put my meat birds on. But just because I don't doesn't mean that I should just throw my hands up and quit and go raise, uh, go buy food from the local grocery store. I've got to do the best I can with what I've got. And unfortunately, like I said, I think sometimes people, and they're, they, they're well-meaning. I, I really do believe they're well-meaning, but they put so much pressure on people or they say things that exclude people from being able to take part in the homesteading journey. For example, a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to another podcast where they were interviewing somebody who practices regenerative farming. And he made this statement. He said, if you're not practicing regenerative farming, then in my opinion, all you have is a glorified CAFO. Now, if you're not familiar with CAFO, CAFO stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. And all you have is a glorified CAFO, and that's unacceptable. So does that mean that if somebody doesn't have hundreds of acres where they can rotationally graze animals, that they should just throw their hands up and quit? No, that's foolishness. Not everybody can do that rotational grazing. Not everybody has that available to them. And yeah, that would be my ideal, but that's not what I have. And so I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got. Now in the future, maybe that'll change. Maybe I'll have some more land. Maybe I'll have a, a situation whereby I can practice that and I will be glad to practice that. But in this particular time, I can't. And if I can't, does that mean that I, I quit? No. I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got. And again, I, I just see this happen over and over and over again in so many different aspects of homesteading, whereby people hold up this ideal and put pressure on people to measure up to something that is simply unattainable. You know, you look at somebody like Joel Salatin, he's had years and years and years to perfect his systems. 
you can't expect somebody who is brand new to raising animals to live up to that model. You look at an Elliot Coleman. He's been doing this for decades. You can't expect somebody who is new to gardening to live up to that model. Well, I certainly love natural, holistic approaches to raising animals and uh, organic methods to be used in my garden. Again, I take a very pragmatic approach to how I manage my animals and how I take care of my gardens. And that is that my goal, my end goal is not to be organic non-GMO. My end goal is to feed my is to feed my family. And so if my animals are dying because I've got this organic non-GMO holistic it has to be I cannot use conventional methodologies and my animals are dying because of that I can't feed my family. So so what's the point? The same way with regards to my garden. Yes, I, I try to be as organic as possible. Up to this point, I have not used conventional fertilizers or herbicides or pesticides in my garden. But if it was a matter of use a conventional herbicide, pesticide, uh, or fertilizer in order for me to be able to feed my family, I'm going to do that because my goal is not to be organic non-GMO. My goal is to feed my family. And so that's why I take a very pragmatic approach to what we do here. I try to do the best I can with what I've got. And I really would recommend you do the same. Certainly, there are those ideals that we have. There are those perfect situations that we would all love to have on our homesteads. But almost none of us, and probably if you were to talk to even the Elliot Coleman's and the Joel Salatins of the world, they're not really even in a perfect situation either. And they're simply trying to do the best they can with what they've got. And they're learning and they're growing. And that's all we can do, folks, as homesteaders, as farmers, is to learn and to grow and to try to take the next best step, the next right step in our journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. As I close this episode out, I do want to be very, very clear that I don't feel like the person who was asking me those questions was trying to pressure me to live up to any particular ideal. I want to be very, very clear about that. She was simply asking me what my philosophical approach is and what I use to feed my animals. And I was very glad to share that with her. But I just want to be very, very clear. I was not feeling pressure from her. When I'm talking about the pressure, the pressure that I see is generally homesteader to homesteader, farmer to farmer. Now, that's certainly not to say that you can't feel pressure from customers. Obviously, you can. And you know, the customer, to a certain extent, is always right, except when they're wrong, of course. <laughs> But if a customer is looking for a particular product or particular methodology, and that's not what you do, that's not the product that you provide, then I think it's important for us to communicate that so that they can find somebody who is more in line with their ideals. I certainly understand that my approach isn't going to necessarily ring the bell for everybody. There are some people who are hardcore, organic, non-GMO, and that's all good. If that's their philosophy, that's their approach, blessings on them. I 100% I support their decision, but that's not where I'm at. Right now, my goal for my homestead is to do the best with what I've got. And I do think that for the vast majority of people who are new to homesteading, that really is the pragmatic, practical approach that you should follow. But at the end of the day, I'm one guy, one guy here in upstate New York, trying to do the best I can with what I got, with what I know. And who knows? I could be wrong. I hope you found this helpful, folks. If you've got any questions, if you've got any comments, I'd be glad to hear them. I'd love to carry on a dialogue about this. If you think I'm dead wrong on this, let's talk. You can reach me at brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. Also, all of our social media accounts are in the show notes, so links to our Facebook, our Instagram, 
accounts, and I would be more than happy to have a conversation with you there as well. If you're new to the podcast and you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd subscribe to this podcast by going to Apple, Google, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, or to the homesteadjourney.net where you can like and subscribe to this podcast. If you haven't already, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave us a review and share this with friends, family, people that you think might be helped by it. As always, the music on this podcast is provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.